us. We come uh, this evening in our verse-by-verse study through the book of 1 Corinthians. If you would make your way to the book of 1 Corinthians, to a text which really tells us and reminds us that we have one life to live. Uh, Some of you all who are um, dated a little bit, do you remember back in the 60s, the, the TV commercial, you only have one life to live? Say it with me. Might as well live it as a blonde. That's right. Remember, there's an old Clairol commercial. Anybody else remember that? Okay, some of you do. Well, you do only have one earthly life to live, and so it is wise that you receive a full reward. This title, Receive a Full Reward, is really taken from 2 John and verse 8, which tells us that. Look to yourselves, that is, watch out, church. It's plural, and it's the word for be aware, be alert, watch out, so that you don't lose the things which you have wrought, that is, uh, which you've earned, but that you receive, we receive, a full reward. So in a very real sense, uh, that is addressing the church corporately so that the corporate body does not lose what um, we have been serving him to gain. Uh, And uh, I'm so thankful that Salvation is out of the picture because we can't work and serve to gain that that's freely given. But we are ordained unto good works, and he does reward faithful service to him. Ergo, we want to receive a full reward. The book of 1 Corinthians, we've already discovered, is filled with believers being unkind to one another, arrogant, um, using poor judgment acting even foolishly at times. And the Corinthian church was divided into a number of factions. They were not very effective at building lives, so they needed to be reminded uh, that it is wise to receive a full reward, serve in light of that, and recognize that that can be in jeopardy for the believer. There will be some who suffer loss, And the text tells us that. If you'd look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12, picking up to verse 11 for the context. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall test every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built upon, uh, which he hath built upon it, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet as by fire, even though there is fire. Know ye not that, th- that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you by the way. The temple of God here is not referencing your physical body. That's in chapter 6. This is plural. It's talking about the body of Christ. You, the church, are the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ's and Christ is God's. First thing I'd like us to consider from the text or observe from the text is found in verses 12 through 15, that is the design of the building. Those who design and construct buildings, that is those who are builders uh, by, by profession, do so with quality in mind. If not, uh, then that person is not going to be in business very long. That person is going to go bankrupt right away. If quality is not in mind, it should be at least. And in order for there to be a quality outcome, some considerations are required. And we see that in our text. First of all, 
The first consideration uh, which is given about the design of this building is that there must be quality materials that are used. Use quality materials. Verse 12 speaks about that. Gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. Mansions are built from costly materials. You think about the Old Testament tabernacle and the temple when the temple was actually constructed. It was designed this way with very precious materials because this was going to be the dwelling place of God. And they wanted it. And in fact, God instructed them to use the highest quality of materials. So what are we building? Well, we're not building a physical structure but we're building lives. That's clearly what the context is addressing. And, and the Word of God speaks to that elsewhere in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 in, in English Standard Version. It says, you yourselves, like living stones, you're not a living stone, but it's like a living stone. You're being built up into a spiritual house. And so our lives individually, uh, and then of course the whole is made up of the sum of the parts, collectively, we are built up on the foundation of Christ, and we are of infinite value to the Lord because he gave himself for us and he has called us uh, to himself uh, and, and wants a holy building being constructed. Uh, what we do as builders is compared to gold, silver, and precious stones. If this building, uh, if, if we are building up one another and ourselves, in the Lord, it's going to be with gold, silver, precious stones uh, in, in a spiritual uh, analogous uh, to our spiritual lives. Notice we're not called to even address the foundation. We don't do anything with the foundation because the foundation is already laid. And that foundation is Christ. Verse 11, very clear. You don't have to worry about the foundation. There isn't any other foundation than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation for the church. So we know that that's secure and solid. We know that that's not going to uh, be uh, shifting and, and cracking and crumbling and, and the like. And, and, and so we don't have to worry about that at all. We're to take heed how we build. Notice in verse 10, I didn't read verse 10. Notice in verse 10 of the same chapter, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let every man take heed how he builds on it. And so what we do on the foundation, it's either going to be gold, silver, and precious stones, or it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble, those things which are cheap, which are easily consumed. And, and uh, there's a degenerating of, of quality of the materials. The wood may look strong, but it's easily consumed in the fire um, compared to the hay. Uh, the hay may seem to be better than the stubble that's left in the field, but any of the three, you're not going to build a solid structure out of that. You're not going to build the Empire State Building just out of wood, and you're certainly not going to build it out of hay and stubble. It's going to be just one match and the entire thing could go up in smoke. Not the case though with gold, silver, and precious stones. And so the materials that we use matter if the building is going to be strong. Folks, it matters how we do church around here. Amen? It matters. Uh, it's not wet your finger, put it in the air, which way is the wind blowing uh, uh, in, uh, in the ecclesiastical um, ether out there. And that's what, how we're going to do church. That's, in fact, what has happened to the American church uh, is let's make things seeker-friendly. Now, just think about that. What kind of, what kind of almost nonsense, if you'll allow me uh, to say that, is that we, as the body of Christ, as the temple of God, as the sheep uh, of, his, uh, of his flock, we are going to say uh, to the dead, depraved, spiritually ignorant and illiterate you tell us how it's best to worship the lord what that's like uh, someone who is who is uh completely unskilled and unlearned in medicine uh the surgeon saying to that person <clears throat> now how do you want me to go about doing your surgery but it's even much 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 worse than that because we're talking about what god has designed and what he says he wants done and so, 
the materials matter if the design is going to be played out in the right way. Secondly, <clears throat> the workers need to work with an inspection in mind. Um, Brother Enoch, you, you, uh, uh, you um, supervise a crew, my guess is. Do you care about how the workers work, putting those roofs on? You do. Is there a supervisor uh, in, that, in, that, uh, in that workspace who looks over the craftsmanship when the job is done? You want it to stay. You want your roof to be solid. You want it to be watertight. Of course, you wouldn't pay those thousands and thousands of dollars otherwise. And so, your work should be with an inspection in mind. In fact, that's what verse 30, or 13 says. Every man's work shall be made manifest. It's going to be revealed. It's going to be inspected. The Lord's going to look. He's going to look into our hearts. He's going to look into our lives and see how the work was done, why the work was, was done, in what way the work was done. And it matters not only the material that we use biblical means, but the way we go about doing it is important as well. That which is unfit will be consumed. And oh my, uh, in 47 years of walking with the Lord nearly. 47? Let me think. Whatever it is. I'd have to get my calculator out anymore. If you notice, you can't do math as easily as you used to. I can't. Uh, how, how much of my work, how much of my service to the Lord has been wood, hay, and stubble? At least a fair amount of it. Some of it, uh, if not a whole lot of it, has been that. Now, what is the wood, hay, and stubble? It's doing things in a non-biblical way, certainly. Using faulty materials. It's doing something uh, with the wrong motive. With the wrong ambition. Without passion. Uh, just going through the motions. Any number of things that one can do. Uh, and I don't mean just in church life. I mean, out in the work world, why am I acting the way I'm acting? Why am I reacting the way I'm doing? Am I doing so for the glory of God, for the praise of the Lord Jesus, that others would be attracted to him, that they would see him in me, or is there some other motive? I received a, a disappointing um, WhatsApp message this week. Didn't even know I could get WhatsApp messages. But it came up on my phone, and I said, What's that? Oh, it's WhatsApp. And, uh, and I read it. And it was a situation that I was going to have with the grandparents' vacation uh, with the grandsons and uh, my son-in-law's parents. So all, all four grandparents were going to be with the, with the boys. And basically, it was a, uh, a, a, an agency which was pulling the rug out from underneath our feet. And this is something I'd planned for probably a few months anyway. And, and so I thought to myself... I mean, I was really, I was really disappointed. It cost a little bit of money, not a whole lot, but really a lot of time and effort. And I was really looking forward. I've been promoting it and everything. And I thought to myself, okay, Vic, we just preached on don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God will guard your heart. Are you all familiar with that text? The book of Philippians. So I said, here's a test. And I am disappointed, and I am going to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so the point I'm making is that in every, every day we face situations in life. I do anyway, and I'm sure you do, where I can opt for reacting in the flesh, anger, uh, uh, being a spoiled sport, complaining, whatever, or... I can say, I am going to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of the faith, the one who judges righteously, the one who knew this from eternity past that this was going to happen, and he allowed me to experience it just maybe as a test. Is this, is Vic going to have wood, hay, and stubble in this situation, or gold, silver, and precious stones? Now, behind my back, Kathy texted all of her family and said, Vic is so disappointed. Pray for him. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> and I would have said, no, I'm a big boy. I can handle this in the Lord. Um, but she did that anyway. <laughs> and, I, and I'm grateful for her, her concern. The point I'm making is 
it matters how you build on this foundation. Work with an inspection in mind, with a passion for him, with humility and dependence on the Lord. Do what Colossians 1.10 says, that we're to be fruitful in every good work. Now, it must be understood, and the text makes it clear, that good works are not the root, but the fruit of our lives in Christ. In fact, Ephesians 2, uh, 10, after it already said, we're saved by grace through faith, it's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. It go, immediately says the very next verse, verse 10, for we are his workmanship. Uh, remember what that word was I've taught us before in the past? It's the word for poetry. We are his piece of art. We are his artistic display in this world. Um, and we're made that way, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And he's ordained in eternity past that we should walk in them. So we're to walk serving him with gold, silver, and precious stones. For that is acceptable to him. Thirdly, relative to uh, the design of this building, not only does it matter what we use and how we go about it, we need to be expectant. Expect a payday. It says that in verses 14 and 15, and I'm using, saying that in a little bit of a crass way, but it does say, you shall receive a reward. There is a payment coming, if you will. Uh, there is remuneration. The Lord is uh, distributing his blessing to you for faithful service. You see, salvation is not in view here. It is my service to the Lord bringing a heavenly reward, heavenly income, um, simply because it's, it's, it alliterates very nicely. And it's something that you receive for what you've done. And that's what income is. Uh, you receive it for what you have done. And 2 Corinthians 5.10 makes this even more clear. For it says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is not for salvation. This is for the believer. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether it be good or bad. And that bad is not the word for evil. It, it's the word for empty, vain, you, uh, worthless. Wood, hay, and stubble. And so look, look at your life. Maybe, uh, maybe don't worry so much about uh, what happened 10 years ago because that's done. Let, let your past not be a hitching post, but a guidepost, okay? Let it direct you in your service now and in the future. But look at your life and is it consumed with that which will burn up or will you receive a reward? Well, when does it happen? When am I going to get this reward? Well, ultimately, you're going to get it when you are in the presence of the Lord. For Jesus said, you shall be recompensed. You will receive your reward at the resurrection of the just. Luke 14, 14. <clears throat> the rest is going to be burned up. And so in, in your spirit, in your heart and mind, what you're doing, how you're doing it, when you're doing it, why you're doing it matters. If it smells like smoke <laughs> and, you, and you, you are sensing that this is going to burn up because it doesn't matter, don't stay, don't stay in that lane. Uh, as Brother Saylor said, um, a few minutes ago that uh, if it is done for vain glory, uh, if it is done for the praise of a man, uh, uh, my word's not his, then uh, it's, it's really, it, not only is it not of any value, it's probably negative. Likely it's negative because it is stealing glory from the Lord, which he alone rightly deserves, right? Amen? And so make sure that what you are doing is gold, silver, precious stones you will be rewarded revelation 4 uh, when the believers are in his presence they will cast these at his feet for he alone is worthy so that's the design of the building secondly the designer of the building verses 16 to through 23 we see that god is the master designer and he is intentional think about the the intentionality of god in the physical creation of the universe, everything is intentional. In fact, theologically, uh, the first law of thermodynamics holds up. 
matter, energy, cannot be created nor destroyed. That is, you can't create anything. God has created everything uh, in, in, uh, in his, it just spoke it into existence, and it is good. That, that's the end of it. There was intention that went into it, and he is intentional in the spiritual building of his people. Notice in our text, in verses 16 through 20, about the designer himself. First of all, he is the owner. The Lord is the owner. Verses 16 through 20, as the owner of the temple, God is protective of it. If uh, those who seek to destroy it, and this is it's a little bit difficult of, of a text because it, it doesn't really expand a lot. But if you'll notice in verses 16 through 20, um, it, uh, it says that uh, uh, in verse um, 17, if any man defile the temple of God, again, talking about the, the local church, him shall God destroy for the temple is, um, it very well uh, uh, is talking about uh, physically, uh, he'll, he'll, um, he'll put to death, just like he did Ananias and Sapphira for lying to the Holy Spirit in the presence of the church. And probably this is referencing the man that we're going to learn about in chapter 5 who was involved in, in uh, gross immorality that even the pagans didn't do. And very well could be uh, referencing him if you are trying to uh, pollute the church, God is going to uh, protect his church ultimately and deal with you. Maybe, maybe it's not referencing him, but it very well could be. Uh, the owner is going to take care of his precious possession. That's what these verses tell us. And the Lord is the owner. And then we see that believers are the occupants of this building. Verses 21 through 23 uh, in the text, uh, we don't glory in, in other one another. We're not fighting one another. We're not in competition with one another. We are all occupants, the leaders uh, and everybody else. Um, and we, there ought not be uh, any, uh, any kind of uh, uh, favorites, no playing favorites uh, among the people of God. You see, folks, think about that. Really, uh, pull over and think about that. Well, I'm, uh, I'm not going to go to my Sunday school class today because that guy's teaching is not my favorite uh, teacher. Or uh, I'm not going to serve on that committee uh, because so-and-so is on this committee and uh, I prefer not to. Now, of course, uh, we all have preferences and styles and likes and dislikes and uh, you like, uh, like tomatoes or, and, and, and I don't. Actually, I love tomatoes. Uh, but you, you follow what, uh, what I'm talking about. There's no room for that in God's holy temple. We're not in competition with one another. And so if the truth is being given, if um, the Lord is being honored, then we should, we must rejoice uh, because we are all part of this, uh, this building that's being uh, erected at, on, on the foundation of Christ. Really, there, we ought to be one big happy family. Now, I'm preaching to the choir because we are. Uh, unless I'm mistaken, we do love one another at this, uh, in this local church. Amen? Uh, and I'm not having to talk you into that. Uh, we really do. And that is how it should be. No division. There's no team Paul, no team Cephas, no team uh, whoever it might be. Um, in fact, notice in verse 21... You belong to Christ. Christ belongs to God. There's no competition there. There's no inter-Trinitarian competition. And that being the case, it means that in the body of Christ, when the truth is being given, when the Lord is being honored, the vessel, I'm just the messenger boy. There can be somebody else, uh, as I alluded earlier, uh, Jacob's going to be preaching, Garrett's going to be preaching, upcoming. And there ought not be really a, any, any preferential uh, uh, approach at, or, or, or response to it. You all hearing what I'm saying here? I mean, it really is important that we see one another uh, on equal footing, at, or equal le uh, level at the foot of the cross. Uh, I am a work in progress. You are a work in progress. I know better than you know how much I am a work in progress and vice versa, right? 
And so we, uh, let's, not be, uh, let's not be a Corinthian and say, well, uh, I'm, on that, I'm on that church member's team. I'm on this committee. Or I want this person on my committee. Or I want this person in my Awana cl- uh, club or whatever it might be. Um, because it is not about you. It is not about me. It is about him. And if that will always be at the forefront of our mind, then we can uh, be assured of receiving a full reward. That's the admonition we're given from this passage. Lord, I'm thankful for your word, the truth of it, the convicting power of it. For, oh, in, in uh, my years of, of church work, how I have seen uh, leaders jockeying for position and how, uh, how um, uh, ugly that is. And Lord, I, I can't uh, think of a time, but certainly with um, my propensity to want to um, be competitive and to win, uh, there has to be times and are times when uh, I've been guilty of that. May that never be the case. For you are the foundation, Lord Jesus. We are building on you being the foundation. And we're going to build with gold, silver, and precious stones, or we're going to foolishly and, and uh, in, in an empty way try to build with wood, hay, and stubble. So I'm thankful for this reminder. I'm thankful for this holy nudge that you've given us to look to receive a full reward because that means you are being honored, others are being blessed, and we as your people are being used. May that always continue. Um, The whole existence of this local church, find us faithful, Lord Jesus, in your blessed name we do pray.